Why is it important for a child in foster care to have a guardian ad litem? Guardian ad litems are really interesting in the courtroom system, and in other places of the country, they're called CASA volunteers, which is Court Appointed Special Advocate. So if you look at the court system for a child in foster care. In a courtroom, you have the judge, and you have the birth parents, and you'll have foster parents, and you'll have attorneys for the birth parents, and attorneys for the state. Mm -hmm. Basically, everybody in that courtroom has a different agenda, or has somebody else that they're answering to, or somebody else's boss, or something else going on. The guardian, or CASA, they are really unique because they are the only person who is there to represent the best interest of the child. So they go in and say, no, this foster parent's not doing what they said they were supposed to be doing. No, this kid is not getting such and such services in school. And basically, sometimes they know the kids more than anybody else because they really focus on their needs and their interests, and they, they don't take no for an answer. They don't, they're not worried about money. I mean, they're volunteers, so I've never met a, you know, a guardian ad litem that's like, well, obviously I do it for that fat paycheck. No. They do it because they really care about kids. And when I was in foster care and I had a guardian ad litem, she was the one that made sure that I was getting my teeth clean and hair cut and had school supplies. I mean, I don't know why my other providers weren't taking care of these things. But what do you think is the biggest issue facing the dependency system today? That's a huge question. Um, I think one of the biggest problems is that we don't have a child-centered focus. We are doing a lot of decision making based on budgets and policies and trends in child welfare instead of saying, okay, what's going to be the best solution for this kid or this sibling group or this family? So if we can circle back to putting basically the child back in child welfare, I think a lot of improvements could be made. If we meet someone and think they may be getting abused after we tell our parents or teacher, what are they supposed to do? I think telling an adult is really important, but what people may not realize that in Florida, everybody is what they call a mandated reporter, which means it's actually against the law to not report child oh. abuse. So traditionally, people like police officers or therapists or teachers, those were mandated reporters, but now the law says that everybody is a mandated reporter. So it's definitely a good idea to talk to an adult, but also if you're really close to them, see what's going on because I think sometimes young people feel much more comfortable with their peers and are perhaps more likely to disclose things to you than they would maybe another adult. Okay. In your uh, books, you give a lot of credit to the adults who helped you, especially your adoptive parents. But you seem to have a special ability to overcome adversity, a special resilience. How are you helping make sure your kids are resilient? Well, I want my children to have a variety of experiences, and I think resiliency only comes when you have an opportunity to overcome a situation. So in my life, I did have a lot of people that were there for me and really helped me overcome really trying times. So as weird as it sounds, in order to instill those principles with my kids, they're going to have to struggle a little bit. Mm -hmm. And so that, that means me not swooping in at every second and fixing everything. It's letting them experience the world, ask questions, find problems that they want to solve themselves. And obviously, I come from a child welfare background. My master's degree is in social work. Um, but maybe they won't be social workers, or maybe they'll find some other kind of humanitarian effort that speaks to them. So I think it's really about helping support them in what their goals are and not imposing a set of standards on your kids. And that's really the key to resiliency is giving them the opportunity to yeah. be resilient. Obviously writing three little words and three more words has put a spotlight on foster care and the thousands of children across the United States who are in foster care. So writing your books has made a major social impact. But what impact has being an author and sharing your story had on your personal life? I think having the opportunities to write these books was, I know it was kind of once in a lifetime, and so when my first book came about, I was only a teenager when I started it, and so I don't know many teenagers that are like, oh, I'm going to write a book now, yeah. so it's like, you don't say no when something like that happens, you really just, as scary as it was, you have to go for these things and just kind of figure it out later. Sometimes the smartest thing to do is just jump, and so that's what I did. So with writing my first book, it was a lot of research. It was going through case files, doing interviews, basically putting it all together like you would a term paper. So I never thought that I would really work on a second book. I didn't really know what I was planning to do in the future, 
But writing and sort of journaling and keeping a diary, that was something that was always really therapeutic for me anyway. Mm -hmm. So after I graduated college, I went on to grad school and got married, and we started thinking about what we wanted to do, and then we became foster parents and fostered for five years, and we've cared for over 20 children, and it was sort of crazy for me because people, I'm 29, so people look at my story and they say, oh, it happened so many years ago, things are so different now, things have changed tremendously. Well, the foster kids that we had in our home, mm -hmm. it, it tells a very different story and it, it was really evident that the same problems that were happening when I was a foster kid are still happening to this day. and. So much so that kids are losing their lives. I think the number is up to over 370 child deaths have happened in Florida this year. And that's really staggering. So I really wanted to answer a lot of questions from the first book, bring readers up to speed about what I'm doing, because I think people still are sort of waiting for the shoe to drop. They don't mm -hmm. quite know. They want to know, oh, well, what's you know, what's going to happen with Ashley? So in terms of my personal life, um, I'm, I'm mostly just really grateful to have had the opportunity, but I also never wanted to be the kind of person that was like, mm, I was abused as a kid. You, you know, yeah. there has to be a way to change it, because I've always believed that it's not enough to complain about something if you're not willing to be a part of that solution. So now as I'm transitioning into my full adult life, I'm, I'm trying to figure out what that looks like. And so I've started a nonprofit organization and an agency to help meet some of the service gaps that we were identifying because you really have to be a part of that solution or no change is ever going to happen. Yeah. Uh, what words of encouragement would you give to any aspiring authors in the Shore Press community? I think writing as a profession is really changing and evolving, and my adoptive mom is also a writer, but she writes you know, really heavy historical fiction, and so even some of the things that I write, she's like, oh, this is awful, but there's, there's such a format for so many things. There are bloggers who are so incredibly successful, and even some of the very best books that are just blowing up, um, they're they're not grammatically correct or they're not put together all that well, the plot's a little blah. And I think at the end of the day, even if you produce something that everyone is raving about, there's gonna be somebody else who doesn't like yeah. it. So you have to really write for yourself. For me, I write for a cause and for a purpose and to be a call to action. And so I think I have sort of educational motives with the things that I write. I'm not um, a fiction writer, I don't write fantasies, those sorts of things. But there's a place for every skill set, every interest, and at minimum, I encourage young people to write down the tasks of their daily lives, if only to have sort of a, a record or a memory of things for themselves. Like, I don't remember, like, all anything that I thought was really important in high school, mm -hmm. like, I barely remember, like, what my mascot looks like. So it's just really important that you are cataloging these times in your lives and yes not everyone's going to turn it into a memoir one day mm -hmm. but it's just something that's going to be really cool for you to share with your kids or for you to look back on and say man i've really been through a lot look at look at everything that i've done and i think that can be really motivating as you move forward i heard that three little words may become a major motion picture is that true uh can you give us any hint to what to expect in one well, I actually, the phone call I have after this is to the producer, so I'm getting an update today. So oh, wow. I don't have an update for you because I'm getting it in a little bit. Um, but it is being made into a movie, and it's so exciting. I'm, I'm mostly excited that this is going to be an opportunity to really open up the conversation about foster care and adoption in the States because, you know, so often when you hear about foster care, it's so so much abuse and so much negativity, but there's really a lot of positives that can come out of adoption and out of these stories. So I'm, I'm very low on the totem pole of people that get information. I have no control whatsoever. Really hoping they don't make me a drug addict or something insane. But I, I think it's just, I'm constantly pinching myself. Are you kidding me? Like mm -hmm. I was just over the bridge living in an orphanage not too yeah. long ago. So. Um, it's it's definitely crazy um, and really exciting. So it's hard for me to answer questions where people are like, "Oh, where do you see yourself in ten years?" Because I have no idea. Yeah. You know, you the, the opportunities and the things that I've ever been, I've been able to do. I mean, no one would have guessed that I would. Oh, I have two books in my twenty. Like, who does that? Yeah. You know, it's it's definitely not something you can predict. So I think it's just a matter of seizing opportunities as they come about, laying the foundations for a variety of possibilities to unfold 
like, you know, do well in school, don't get arrested, don't do drugs. The, the basics, you know, put you on a pretty good path to eventually be prepared to do something huge when that opportunity comes about. So it's a little bit here and there that suddenly you wake up and you're like, whoa, this, this huge thing is happening. But you have to kind of put in that initial work. And yes, kids are going to make mistakes. Obviously, I did stupid things when I was a teenager and when I was in school. But the really important things, the things that matter, you know, reputation and school and grades and those really key decisions, um, if, you, if you make the right choices, just unbelievable things can happen with your life. Thank you.